Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be symbiotic interactions. Let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going. So by the end of this video, a couple things you should know or be able to do. First one, explain how competition leads to the redistribution of resources and compare and contrast various species interactions. So today's video is probably going to be a review of some stuff that you may have had in environmental science or biology, but it's good stuff to remember. We're going to add a little bit to it. So first thing that I want you to kind of know to start off is the concept of an interspecific species interaction. Interspecific just means that you have two species interacting with one another. It could be good interaction, could be a bad interaction, but if you've got two different animals interacting with one another, it is known as an interspecific species interaction. Now, these interactions can have all sorts of outcomes. The first one, the major one, the one that is, I guess, most recognized is competition. And this is the reality of our world, that two species will compete for a limited resource. Now, for example, oxygen wouldn't really count because there is an abundant supply of oxygen. Everybody uses oxygen, so there's no competition going on there. But in the case of the carcass that we've got hyenas and the lion fighting over, that would be a case where you've got a limited resource, one carcass, two organisms are competing for that carcass. And in a lot of the interactions I'm going to be talking about today, there's some sort of interspecific competition going on between two species. When two species compete with one another, you can get a situation called competitive exclusion, where essentially one species outcompetes the other and pushes it out of the area. So in that last uh, slide, if you had the lions being successful at defending their territory and pushing the hyenas out, that would be an example of competitive exclusion. So one organism wins, the other loses, the loser gets pushed out of the area. That is competitive exclusion. And there's also the idea of an ecological niche. And essentially, an ecological niche is an organism's job in the ecosystem. The plants and animals it uh, interacts with, the places it lives, maybe it alters the habitat. Everything that it does in an area is its niche. And know that only one animal can occupy a niche because usually one animal is uniquely adapted to do what it does. So the animal's place in the world is the niche, and that is driven by resource partitioning. Now, if you got two uh, species competing with one another, sometimes you can get competitive exclusion like we just talked about, but more frequently you'll get resource partitioning, which is basically some sort of I don't know, agreement that occurs between the two organisms where they use the same resource in different ways or different times. So kind of a classic example of resource partitioning is a pine tree that is inhabited by several different types of birds. And what we see in this pine tree is that species A of birds might live up here in the top outer region of the tree. Species B might inhabit the interior. And species C may hang out here in the bottom region of the tree. So that would be resource partitioning, where you have one resource space in the tree and three species figuring out how to use it to where everybody gets what they need. So that's an example of resource partitioning. Now, through the rest of the video, I'm going to be going through specific species interactions, and they're going to be denoted using this positive-negative uh, symbol system. So positive obviously means the species is being benefited. Negative means that the other species is being harmed. You can have positive-positive. You can have negative-negative. A lot of times competition, just competition itself, is negative-negative because while one species will win and one species will lose, they are both going to be harmed through using energy, maybe being damaged, whatever. But in predation, you have a clear winner and a clear loser. Um, predation has pushed for some evolutionary adaptations to combat preda predation. Um, those include cryptic coloration, which is basically camouflage, organisms being camouflaged to blend in and not be found. Aposomatic coloration, which is super bright coloration. Think poison dart frog saying, hey, I'm poisonous, don't eat me. Um, there is mimicry, where a harmless species may look like a harmful species to avoid being preyed upon. But either way, predation 
one clear winner, one clear loser, and that has pushed essentially like an evolutionary arms race forward where the prey have evolved to adapt to being preyed upon and maybe avoid that situation a little bit. You also have that herbivory, which isn't a type of predation that most people think of because people don't think of plants as preys, but they are living organisms that are definitely not benefiting in the interaction. So in herbivory, obviously the herbivore wins and the plants lose. You've got parasitism, which is another win-lose situation. The only thing that I want to kind of use to denote this from predation, in predation, the prey dies. Okay, the predator wants to kill the prey and eat it. In parasitism, there is a serious problem if the parasite kills the host, because if the host dies, the parasite dies too. So it is symbiosis in that both organisms are living together, staying alive, and if at all possible, the parasite wants to make sure that its host keeps on living. All right, let's start talking about some interactions that involve mutual benefit. Mutualism would be one example of this. Positive, positive, everybody wins. There are tons of examples of mutualism. One of the classic ex examples are bees and flowers. The bees get the um, pollen and the honey, and not the honey, the nectar. Um, they take that nectar from the plant and use it for energy to benefit the hive. Um, the plant, obviously, they get the carrying of the pollen from one flower to the next out of the deal. So bee wins by getting nectar, flower wins through pollination, everybody's happy. And you've got commensalism, where you could essentially think of it as saying, well, I guess it's all right. In commensalism, one species benefits, and the other one, I guess I should have put a zero there instead of a plus. Um, but in commensalism, one benefits, the other one isn't harmed, isn't helped, is just kind of there. And Kind of a classic example of this is the clownfish and the anemone because the clownfish hangs out in the anemone and receives protection from the anemone. Although many people are starting to argue that this might be an example of mutualism because as that clownfish eats food, it drops some uh, crumbs that the anemone is able to pick up and eat. So not the best example, but it's kind of a classic example. Maybe a better example of commensalism would be flowers that live in the branches of trees just kind of hanging off on the uh, branches. The tree doesn't really get anything out of it, but the plant is raised up in the air where it has better access to resources. So that might be a better example of commensalism. And that's it for the day. Nice, quick, short, easy. Um, hope that helped you out with some biological interactions or relationships. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.